My pleasure to introduce Aaron Hamlin this afternoon talking about the plur plurality pandemic. Um, Aaron is the executive director at the Centre for Election Science. It's a non-profit which studies and advocates for better voting methods. Uh, he's written articles for publication like Deadspin and The Telegraph. He's also been featured uh, in Popular Mechanics, NPR, Reason, Vox and MSNBC for his expertise on voting. Aaron is also a licensed attorney and has two graduate degrees in the social sciences. If you want to ask Aaron a question, please submit it via the Bizabo app. Uh, and please join me now in welcoming Aaron to the stage. Elections have vast consequences for everyone. And so it's a real shame that we run them so poorly. But well, why is that? Let me tell you a story about when I was in graduate school. This was in 2008. This was during an election year. And so I was out to dinner with my friends, and we were all talking about who we were going to vote for. And there was something that was disconcerting to me. So as we were going around and we were talking about who we were voting for, all my classmates were talking about voting for people who I knew had ideologies and views that didn't align with their own. And this disconnect was really alarming to me. And so I, I walked away from that dinner upset, and I kept asking these why questions. Why was it that my friends were voting against their interests? And I'm sure you've all had these why questions too. Why, why is it that we elect terrible people to office? Why is it that better people don't run? Why are certain candidates marginalized? So this why question led me to the voting booth, and particularly a specific place in the voting booth, the ballot box. So when, when you're looking at the ballot itself within the, ballot, uh, within the voting booth, you see these directions that say, vote for one. And they seem innocent enough, but this has a huge impact. This is called plurality voting, or first past the post. But because those are kind of tongue twisters, and I'm trying to get through my talk, I'm just going to call it this choose one voting method. So why is it that just choosing one candidate causes all of these problems? There are some symptoms for what's going on here. So we would like a voting method to elect strong winners who are more consensus style winners, but instead we see more polarizing winners. We would like elections to be more inclusive uh, so that we encourage more candidates to run, but instead we're, certain, we're seeing certain candidates not run instead for fear of not being viable, where we use proxy measures for viable, like whether a certain candidate has money or whether they have name recognition. But those attributes aren't necessarily good predictors for whether someone will do a good job in office. We would also like to see more inclusivity so that when people bring good ideas to the table, we are able to get a good measure of support for what those ideas are. But instead, we see ideas marginalized. There are also, we, so why, why is it that we see these outcomes? Well, the voting method that we have encourages us to betray our favorite. So imagine there's a candidate that you like, but you see that candidate is not being viable. So instead of choosing that candidate, you, you instead choose someone else that you're just okay with among the, the front runners. So you don't actually get a show support for the candidates that you like. We also have this voting method that is not expressive. We only get to choose one candidate. But if you have feelings about other candidates, you don't get to indicate that. And then finally, there's an issue with vote splitting. So if there are multiple candidates that are similar, we can't choose all of those candidates. Uh, so another candidate who doesn't have similar candidates running alongside them, uh, the vote can be split between them. Some people look at this as saying, OK, well, there's this issue with this choose one voting method. We'll just do a runoff, and that'll be OK. But that doesn't solve the issue. We still miss out on that consensus candidate. So we can imagine that consensus candidate being someone somewhere in the center. But here, if someone is in the center, the vote gets divided on the left 
and on the right. And so that candidate in the middle doesn't make it to the runoff. This is true even with ranking methods that try to uh, simulate sequential runoffs that candidate in the middle still gets knocked out with other methods such as ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting. So what happens if this is untreated? What kinds of consequences does it have when we elect these, uh, when we use this terrible voting method to elect people at office? Well, these people in office have a lot of responsibility. One of those responsibilities is spending vast amount of money. And we can think about all the things that we would like to see prioritized with funding, but we're really talking about an enormous amount of money. Over worldwide, uh, government, uh, government spending totals to over $20 trillion. Now, that's a number that's not really easy to wrap our heads around. So just imagine $100 bills in US currency stacked up the size of skyscrapers surrounding the Statue of Liberty. So, Funding is not, uh, government spending is not the only uh, reason this is an important cause area. So people who are elected do more than just spending. They also control the policies that govern our day-to-day -day lives. Not just our lives, but also uh, animals as well, looking at these policies. So we're looking at things like um, criminal justice reform, whether we treat inmates civilly, looking at uh, making sure that they can move back into society, or if we instead use policies now that, ha that uh, uh, keep them from other human contact by keeping them in solitary confinement. Uh, looking at mental health issues, whether we decide to send people to war, uh, looking at uh, uh, bio, um, biosafety risks, looking at animal welfare, uh, do, we use, uh, uh, do we concern ourselves with uh, animal welfare or do we allow factory farming to continue? Uh, do we address environmental issues or do we allow CO2 levels to rise? Do we uh, address AI safety or do we uh, ignore it? And when we're talking about the voting method and all of these spending issues that it affects and all the policies that it affects, it's important to realize that this is something that happens at a worldwide scale. So this map that we see in front of us this looks at all the places that use either our current uh, choose one voting method or a runoff type system. Uh, so we see the same issues as we uh, did before. In green, we see places where uh, they use a, a ranking method that simulates a runoff uh, election. Now, we mentioned earlier that that simulation using that ranking method can lead towards a lot of the same issues as that runoff method that we saw before. So, Right now, as bad as this map looks with all that red using that crappy voting method, it's actually worse because the green isn't that good either. Now, uh, to be a little bit more optimistic, when we're looking at, before we were talking about single winner uh, uh, methods uh, for executive offices, uh, here we're talking, uh, here this is a map of places that use different types of proportional methods. Now, proportional methods are a big step up. They address a lot of issues such as uh, gerrymandering, um, but focusing, uh, it's important to also recognize that when we're looking at using a single winner voting method, that it's important that we get executive offices right, because executive offices, these are the people who sign in legislation, and they often tend to be the most powerful lobbyists there are. So what do we do about all this? So we have this terrible voting method. What do we do as an alternative? Approval voting is another voting method that allows you to select as many candidates as you want. This is very easy to do. It works on the dumbest of voting machines. You can hand count it. There are no issues there. But it also has these really nice features in addition to being really simple. So imagine if there's a candidate that you like, but they're not really perceived as being very viable. Under approval voting, you can support that candidate, and you can also support one of the front runners at the same time. You don't have to worry about throwing your vote away. If there are multiple candidates that you like, you can support multiple of those candidates. If you want to hedge your bets against a candidate that you don't like, you can do that with another candidate, say a more uh, moderate compromise candidate. This voting method also tends to select more consensus winners. 
It gives third parties and independents a much more accurate reflection of support. And it encourages more candidates to run who otherwise wouldn't because they don't have to worry about that viability issue. So how does this look in practice? We can see from polling research, uh, so for instance, this is a 2007 French study. Here we can see under uh, plurality voting, uh, or, or choose one voting method shown in red, that we actually have a different winner compared to approval voting. So in this race, this French uh, election, uh, Sarkozy won under the choose one method, also won in the, in the runoff. But uh, Baru, a more moderate candidate, looks like would have won under approval voting, a more consensus style candidate compared to the more extreme candidate, Sarkozy. Something else that we see here, in addition to the winner changing, is that third parties and independents did much better. So we see huge uh, improvement there from five to 10 times as much support. And it's important to note that this is something consistent that we see, but you can't marginalize candidates or ideas in the same way uh, when they have, say, 20% uh, support versus, say, 1% support. We see this again in the 2009 German election. Here, the winner didn't change, and the winner doesn't always change with the voting method, but a voting method has other jobs to do besides just selecting the winner. It's important that we gauge that support for other candidates. So, for instance, here, we can see candidates, in one instance, get just like a, a few percentage points of support, but under approval voting, when their actual support is shown, they're getting up to as much as 30% support. Now, even if, say, we were using approval voting in this election, even if those candidates didn't win, they would have got their ideas heard in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. They may have had certain policy issues even co-opted by the front-runner candidates, which is a big win for them if they just care about the policy issues. It's also important to note that some candidates didn't change too much uh, from the choose one method versus approval voting. And that's because approval voting doesn't magically make you a better candidate. You still have to be a good candidate even under approval voting. It'll capture your support, but your support actually has to be there. Here in, uh, here's a US election. So this is from 2016. Uh, there we see that the winner under our choose one method and approval voting is the same. So Clinton wins in both instances. Now, some, some of you may be thinking, well, like I thought Trump had, had won. And that's true, but you have to remember that in the US, we managed to take the worst voting method there is and make it even worse by nesting it under the Electoral College. We also look at third parties. Uh, here we've got Johnson from the Libertarian Party and Stein from the Green Party. That same, this is a feature that we see time and again under approval voting. That more accurate reflection of support for third parties and independents. Uh, Stein goes from 1 to 12%. Johnson goes to 3 to 21%. The, these are candidates who are completely excluded from every single debate because of the small amount of support that they had. But that doesn't have to be the case when we're using approval voting. Also, something else that's interesting here, in that same year, Gallup had done a poll that asked people if they knew who in the role of these other candidates were. Two-thirds of people didn't because they were getting marginalized in the media. Imagine the positive reinforcement loop that would allow them to get more attention. And not just them, but other candidates. We recall that under our current voting method, it can cause candidates not to run. This was the case in 2016 when Bloomberg decided not to run. Surely there were other strong candidates who had decided not to run either uh, as well because they didn't want to split the vote or they didn't perceive themselves as being viable. So here we're, we're talking about how terrible our current voting method is, how there's this uh, much better alternative. How does this actually happen in practice? How do we change this? So now I've got another story for you. This is a story of Fargo, North Dakota. Fargo, North Dakota had an interesting election in 2015. It was a five-way race where the winner had 22% of the vote. And this was frankly embarrassing for the commission. So what the commission did, they created a task force. And one of those members of the task force was particularly zealous about this issue, done their homework about approval voting and had reached out to us. We talked and we recognized that approval voting was gonna be a strong solution for Fargo. 
He took it back to the task force itself. The task force went ahead and got everyone on board and then presented it to the commission itself and recommended approval voting for the city of Fargo. And you know what the commission had did after the task force it created recommended approval voting? It ignored the task force for an entire year. But I'll tell you what, that did not settle well for this particular member on the task force. So you know what he did? He gathered everybody he knew and got, uh, he's, so, <laughs> there's a really cool picture here of uh, the person on the task force, uh, Jed, who was able to gather all of these signatures and he was able to get approval voting on the ballot itself, which had never done, been done before. And of course, there was a little bit of a spoiler there. We won. So Fargo, North Dakota became the first city ever in the US to implement approval voting. And we won by a lot, 63.5%. We won in every single precinct in the city of Fargo. So, how do we do this? How do we replicate this? So there are certain things that we look for. So we want to make sure that we are able to get local support from the community. And, and here we had a member from the community reach out to us who is also well connected. We also need to focus on single winner elections. So here we were focusing on uh, the mayoral election. The city itself has to be able to have the control to change their own voting method, which was the case here because North Dakota is a home rule state. And also, we have to use ballot initiatives. So you may be wondering to yourself, well, why was it that the commission itself uh, didn't listen to the task force? It's important to remember that one of the people on that commission was the same person who won with 22% of the vote. And I tell you what, he was not real excited to change the voting method that allowed him to slide into office. So right now, we have this situation where we are using the worst voting method there is to elect people to office who then choose how we spend all of our immense amounts of taxpayer dollars and as well as uh, deciding the policy that governs our everyday lives. And not just our lives, but the lives of animals and other sentient beings who experience suffering. But this is a solvable issue, as we showed in Fargo, a population of 120,000 people. This is also scalable, as we'll show next year, in the city of St. Louis, which has a population two and a half times larger of over 300,000. And this is replicable further, as we'll show in the future in other cities and states. But this is replicable not just in the United States, but across the globe. Now, but it's important to remember too that unless we have resources to push this forward, we will continue to use this awful voting method to make these incredibly important decisions on electing people to office who make these decisions about both the spending and policy that control not just the lives of people who exist today, but the lives of many future people more than who exist now. Now, I'm not here to say that this is a magic bullet, but approval voting is one of the most impactful interventions that we have the power to achieve. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that, Aaron. So a few um, questions that kind of came to mind. So what, what is the biggest, I mean, the, you know, you've made the case for it, what's the biggest pushback you get? Is it just inertia, status quo, incumbents like the way things work? Uh, from people who are elected, there's a little bit of incumbents like the way things work, mm -hmm. but we just circumvent that by, we just don't ask them. Uh, we do mm -hmm. a ballot initiative instead. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in terms of uh, um, uh, barriers, we, uh, there's not so much in terms of uh, pushback from members of the community. Uh, we're really, in terms of pushing forward, funding is the main issue that holds us back. Mm -hmm. uh, ballot initiatives are very expensive to run. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then how can people act on that? Where, where would they donate to? Uh, the Center for Election Science, uh, our website at electionscience.org. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we communicate with other, about other partners that we work with. And we also provide opportunities to be able to donate to our partners directly. Yeah. OK. Um, and have you seen other examples outside of the US of this, of this working well? Or are you mainly kind of US focused currently? Uh, right now, we're focused on the US. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, this, Fargo is the only city in the entire world that has implemented approval voting. Um, so we are real trailblazers here in this area. Mm -hmm. Um, so could you expand on why ranked choice voting uh, is not a good solution for the problems that you've laid out? Uh, so approval voting is nice because it has this very low complexity cost. It's very easy to implement mm -hmm. and it does a great job in electing strong winners. It captures a, a support for people who even uh, don't run and it has a low barrier to entry for people who, um, who are looking to run. With ranked choice voting, it's way more complicated so uh, the, you, you're looking at whoever has the most first choice votes. If someone has more than half, that person wins. If not, you look to the person with the fewest first choice votes. You eliminate them, transfer their next uh, preference mm -hmm. to the next candidate. Uh, then you add up all the votes against you. If anyone has more than uh, half of the first choice preferences, if yes, you've got a winner. If not, you repeat through that all again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of complicated with approval voting. You just Choose as many as you want. Most votes wins. Um, it's, you don't have to worry about special voting machines. Where with ranked choice voting, you do. Um, and then also with ranked choice voting, like I mentioned before, with the center squeeze effect, you can take a very clearly strong winner and not elect that winner. Mm -hmm. There are also issues with ranked choice voting where you can't honestly support your honest favorite. It can actually give you a worse outcome. And then for third parties and independents, the ranked choice voting algorithm doesn't do a good job at showing all the data at the same time. It's only looking at a portion of the data at any one point. And that can mean that you really don't get a very good picture for the support of third parties and independents. Whereas approval voting, in addition to being a simple algorithm of just addition, you also see all the data at the same time, which means that you can see all the support for third parties and independents, whereas you just can't see that in the same way with ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. And is there actually any sort of rigorous studies or investigations uh, on, in terms of how hard voters or easy they find it to understand uh, approval voting compared to other methods. I mean, intuitively, mm -hmm. it's very compelling, but have there been any studies? Um, not explicitly comparing uh, understandability, um, but in terms of education campaigns and partners that we, uh, partners and prospective partners that we've spoken to, the simplicity has a really uh, big impact compared to uh, ranked choice mm -hmm. voting. So if we think about complexity, there's like different ways that we can uh, measure that. One perhaps proxy measure would be how long it takes to explain something. So if you went back and tried to remember how long it took me to explain approval voting, choose as many as you want, most votes wins, versus all those sentences I said to explain ranked choice voting, mm -hmm. that's perhaps one measure of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes a long way in being able to communicate like this, this voting method. Um, so what do you think of attempting uh, statewide change somewhere already beyond the choose one method such as Maine? Uh, or do you feel city level change is the best place to start? So with state level change, I think that's important and we will certainly move up to that. Um, so our strategy overall has been to show a proof of concept, which we are doing in Fargo, uh, then scaling and replication, which we're doing in St. Louis. So the next target will be even larger, um, over half a million, uh, and then uh, we'll be able to look at states themselves. So we have to show a little bit of a track record before uh, going at the, at the state level. Yeah. And what do you think about timelines for that progress? Uh, again, we're, we're largely funding constrained. So if the funds are there, we can move very quickly. As we showed, because in the end of 2007, sorry, 2017, we received a grant from Open Plan 3 Project. Mm -hmm. And then within less than a year of receiving that grant, we made Fargo happen. Mm -hmm. So we're very quick and we're very efficient with the funds. OK, great. And, and how big is the organization currently? Uh, our fourth hire will be uh, coming in on Tuesday. OK. Wow. Um, and what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> is this the fourth hire? No. You know. <laughs> um, 
So what, what do you think of the viability of the National Popular Vote Compact? Uh, so interestingly, like, with the National Popular Vote Compact, it's, uh, so which is just a way of using an interstate compact or an agreement between states to get a national popular vote. Well, I don't celebrate too heavily on that. Like, it's mm -hmm. still better. Like, for instance, we would have gotten Clinton uh, who, using different metrics, we can see is a better outcome than, than Trump uh, in the 2016 election. <coughs> um, so it, it, it can be material in terms of the outcome. But we have to remember that even if we do that, we're still using the worst voting method there is. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one nice component about approval voting is that it can interact with the interstate compact, which means that it has features like precinct summability, which ranked choice voting does not have, um, and you can tabulate results with discordant states who aren't using approval voting because you can take this choose one data uh, from other states and add it with approval voting data and you can sum those together. But you can't add ranking data and then uh, choose one data at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, please join me in thanking Aaron for his time today.